Hi, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's 6 p.m. in Paris, 5 p.m. in London, 6 p.m. in Rennes, in the west of France. And it is my uh, great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this uh, new webinar by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology, the ICH. I'm Mohamed Muti from the Sorbonne University and St. Antoine Hospital in Paris, in France. And it is my privilege to moderate today this webinar entitled Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease, a Public Health Challenge Not Sparing Hematology. And to discuss this new emerging, I would say, threat, uh, we have the top expert in this field, namely Professor Pierre Brissot, who is an emeritus professor at the University of Rennes, probably the uh, best European and international expert in the field of iron metabolism and iron-related diseases, and most importantly, among the many functions and titles and awards he held, he is an active member of the. National Academy of Medicine in France, which is probably the most prestigious uh, institution. And you may remember uh, a couple of years ago, Professor Brissot uh, uh, gave us a fantastic uh, uh, webinar, one probably the most popular webinar of the Academy uh, during the year uh, that was about hemochromatosis. And he kindly today accepted uh, to discuss this issue of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because among the complications actually we can see uh, hematologic uh, uh, manifestations and one of the uh, triggers is considered actually uh, to be uh, related to iron abnormalities but professor Brissot will explain uh, this to you uh, in uh, full details. And as usual, please don't hesitate uh, to send your questions and comments, suggestions, because we will have uh, a Q&A session uh, at the end. And this is a live event. So uh, Pierre, Professor Bristow, the floor is yours. Thank Once you very much, Professor Moti. Dear Mohamed, it's a privilege also for me and a, a real pleasure to speak again uh, for the International Academy of Clinical Hematology. And we will speak, as you said, on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So let's first uh, situate the frame of this presentation. Uh, we, will speak, we will speak on fatty liver and fatty liver, which is not alcohol related, which is not drug related. You know that a number of drugs may cause uh, fatty liver, such as corticosteroid, mesotrexate, amiodarone, tamoxifene. And also we not speak of fatty liver due to genetic disease that you can see in children, uh, such as hypobeta lipoproteinemia, uh, hereditary intolerance of fructose, and so on. So what we will deal with today is really fatty liver, which is related to the so-called metabolic syndrome. So just a word to recall the main components of the metabolic syndrome. You do know that uh, this syndrome involves more or less an increased body weight, which is of the android type, but you know also that true metabolic syndromes can exist uh, without increased body weight. So increased body weight, not always, which can be more or less associated to an increased blood pressure, to an increased lipidemia, and mostly to an increased uh, <clears throat> glycemia. And so uh, I propose that you consider successively the following challenges, epidemiology, pathophysiology, diagnosis and treatment. And for each of these sections, uh, I will try to give you the hematological 
cool uh, standpoint for these various items. So I will try from time to time to uh, uh, be transformed into, uh, and will do my best to become from time to time an hematologist. So let's start first with the epidemiological aspects, knowing that all of this uh, will try to lead to some conclusion, to some recommendations. Epidemiology, <clears throat> we have to consider prevalence and prognosis of the fatty liver. First, prevalence. Throughout the world, uh, a study uh, which involved more than 1 million persons belonging to 17 countries shows that the overall prevalence, uh, prevalence of fatty liver was between 25 and 30%. In France, a large cohort uh, involving more than 100,000 individuals shows that the prevalence was pretty similar. Interestingly, this French study focused on the possible risk factors. And the main conclusion was the following. When you have obesity, you have a risk of 80% to develop fatty liver. When you have diabetes, is 60%. And when you have a slight increase, moderate increase in transaminases, it's about 50%. And if you combine these three factors, almost 100% of the uh, individuals do have uh, a fatty liver. So what about uh, the situation in uh, hematology in terms of prevalence? We can say that, of course, uh, you are sharing with your patients the same starting population. So you are supposed to meet this type of uh, uh, fatty liver situation. But if we look at the de novo uh, situation, uh, possibility of uh, fatty liver in hematological diseases, it's more difficult to answer. Because for instance, if you look at these three nice and large study, this study is focused on the metabolic syndrome in hematological patients, but not really on the liver. And the only study that was able to find uh, was a, a study <clears throat> by Del Vecchio, who showed uh, in a series of uh, children with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, acute uh, lymphoblastic uh, leukemia, uh, a significant increase of uh, fatty liver disease uh, uh, evaluated at about 40%. So let's say a word now about the prognosis of uh, the fatty liver. You have two types of uh, considerations. One is the hepatic one, and the second is the prognosis, which is related not uh, to the liver complication, but since we are in a polymetabolic situation, a systemic disease, to the extrahepatic complication. So first, let's see what is the prognosis in terms of hepatic uh, situation. In other words, let's have a look, quick look to the natural history of uh, fatty liver disease. We are starting with a normal liver, and then we have a simple steatosis, benign steatosis. But in 10 to 20% of the cases, this steatosis will become inflammatory, aggressive, and will progressively destroy the liver. And it's what we call uh, in hepatology NASH for non alcoholic steatohepatitis. And the prognosis of NASH, of uh, this NASH, is related to the possible development of fibrosis. And this fibrosis can lead to cirrhosis. And as for every type of cirrhosis, whatever its etiology, you have a risk uh, to develop uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. More specifically, it has been proposed that uh, NASH could go directly to uh, hepatocellular cancer without always uh, going through the step of cirrhosis. So we see that the fatty liver disease can be a severe situation. And it's, it's admitted today that uh, it's a, in the US, it is a second case of uh, end-stage liver disease and the first situation which indicates liver transplantation in women in the USA. What about now? Uh, the prognosis in terms of extrahepatic complications. Since we are in systemic diseases, we will not uh, be surprised to have the possibility of development of cardiovascular events related to atherosclerosis. And also, maybe less expected, 
it has been uh, reported and uh, proves that there is an increased prevalence of various types of cancers in the uh, fatty liver situation. And what is interesting is that if you consider the cause of death, it is admitted that 50% of the fatty liver patients will die from cardiovascular events and not from their liver. A few words about uh, other further complications of two types. You have an impact which will be proven on the quality of life and also an economic impact. This economic impact is due to two types of uh, factors. You have the direct consequences uh, related to hospitalization, to outpatients follow-ups, to investigation, and the indirect consequences which are related to the professional loss uh, uh, of activities. And you can see here that financially, it's quite significant, both in European countries and in the US. What about the prognosis if you consider the hematological point of view? Uh, it's, as you expect, uh, difficult because we have very scarce data. I will just refer again to the uh, work by Del Vecchio, who shows that in his series of uh, children with acute leuke leukemia, uh, there was significantly an increase of early left ventricular dysfunction. So we have seen the first section, the epidemiological aspect in terms of prevalence, prognosis. Let's now move to briefly to some asophysiological aspects. What is uh, the fatty liver? If you consider an hepatocyte, the fatty liver corresponds to the increase of free fatty acid within the hepatocyte. And this increase in free uh, fatty acid may have three main sources. One is uh, the increased alimentary input of glucids, and especially of fructose, uh, fruit juices, soda. You know that this disease is also called, in France, la maladie du soda, the soda disease. The second possible source is increased alimentary uh, uh, input of uh, lipids. And the third, which is important, is when you have the combination of uh, metabolic syndrome and sedentarity because both factors are responsible at the uh, cellular level for decrease of insulin. And this decrease of insulin will lead to an increased lipolysis of triglycerides uh, in the extrahepatic adipose tissue and will be the third and important source of free fatty acid. And when the hepatocyte is overwhelmed by the fluxes of uh, free fatty acid, some lipotoxic deposits will develop, will create an inflammation, and this inflammation will impact both the hepatocyte and also uh, many organs outside the liver. So let's have a look now to the possible specificity of the pathophysiology for the hematologist. Uh, we have, of course, the basic uh, scheme, which is here. But we will focus on the relationship in hematology between some situation and the metabolic syndrome. And you have two main uh, conditions to be considered. The one is uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And the second is uh, the graft versus host disease. And of course, there is relationship between these two situations. So let's consider first the relationship between hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and the metabolic stem cell syndrome. It has been reported that about 30 to 50% of these patients will develop a metabolic syndrome. And the factor, one of the factors, uh, may be the role of total body irradiation possibly through the decrease of hormones, which are called, as you know, incretins, and you have the GLP-1, which is the glucagon-like peptide 1, or the GIP, which is a glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, and these factors could favor the development of uh, uh, fatty liver. What about now the relationship between graft versus host disease and the metabolic syndrome? It has been reported that 10 years after GVHD, uh, about 75% of the patient may develop uh, diabetes. And here, the factors uh, <clears throat> may be 
uh, numerous. You may have, of course, the role of the corticosteroids, the role of the carcinurin inhibitors, the role of the mTORs inhibitors. And just would like also to recall you that corticosteroids themselves can uh, promote the development of sarcopenia. And uh, just to uh, keep in mind that uh, muscle atrophy sarcopenia can coexist with obesity. And we know that sarcopenia is usually, usually a poor prognosis factor, prognosis factor in uh, all these patients. So we have seen the pathophysiology, and we now can move on to the heart of the matter and for the clinician, which is the diagnostic aspects. So we have two steps for the diagnosis. We have first to prove that there is steatosis, and second, to know if there is fibrosis and what is the severity of this fibrosis, because the fibrosis is the main prognostic factor in terms of the evolution of uh, the liver disease. So first step, uh, how can we diagnose ten, uh, steatosis? As always, it's a kind of uh, three-stage rocket. You have clinical examination, biology, and imaging. Let's say well of uh, for these three steps. First, the clinical examination. From the liver point of view, it's difficult to prove or to suspect steatosis because a big liver the smooth, busy liver is difficult to, to find out in the context of abdominal obesity. More importantly, the clinical examination will help you to situate the overall atmosphere of uh, the metabolic syndrome, increased body weight, increased blood pressure, family uh, past history of uh, uh, atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease, uh, strokes, and so on. So the clinical examination first. What about the importance of biology for the diagnosis of steatosis? Again, we have two types of uh, uh, parameters. First type are the liver parameters. And we can suspect uh, steatosis when you have a mild increase in transaminases, often associated, in fact, to a mild increase in GGT and without alcoholism. And the second set of parameters are metabolic parameters. And you will not be surprised to find again here uh, hyperglycemia, hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia. And I just would like to uh, insist uh, here on another metabolic parameter, which is maybe not sufficiently recognized, which is the increase in serum ferritin. You know, more than 90% of your patients that you will see in your practice with a high uh, serum ferritin are not iron overloaded, but this ferritin is a marker, is a dysmetabolic marker. And to differentiate between ferritin from iron overload cause and uh, from metabolic, you have just to check the serum iron. And in case ferritin means a metabolic parameter, you have a normal serum iron, in other words, a normal transferrin saturation. So this is input of biology. What about now the imaging technique to, uh, to a certain uh, steatosis? We all know that the major technique is the ultrasound examination, very simple, and uh, which will give you an aspect which is said hyper echogenic, uh, a bright liver, which can prove uh, the existence of uh, a fatty liver. So this is the first step. With clinical examination, biology, and imaging technique, you can prove that you have fatty liver. Now, the second step for the clinician is, of course, to know what about fibrosis. <clears throat> and again, we will resort to the same three rocket, three stage rocket diagnostic uh, algorithm clinical examination, biology, and imaging. First, what about clinical examination? Here, we should keep in mind the importance of the simple clinical exam to prove cirrhosis. And each time you have a large uh, liver with a lower head, which is both irregular, sharp, and hard, especially if associated with uh, spider angiomas, you can ascertain that you have cirrhosis and you don't need any further complementary investigations. So the clinical exam can be very important to prove cirrhosis. This second step is the biology. Here you have also two types of parameters. Uh, one is represented by the liver function test. And when you have 
a severe cirrhosis, a severe cirrhosis. You can have hepatic failure, which can be expressed biochemically by a loss, by a drop in the prothrombin time, thrombin test, uh, and uh, sometimes hyperbilirubinemia. But we should uh, know that uh, uh, this, this liver dysfunction only appears very late in the natural history of, of cirrhosis, almost decompensated cirrhosis. But for a very long time, uh, the liver function tests are very poorly uh, disturbed uh, during, during cirrhosis. So, it's to say all the importance of a new type of biology, uh, which is what we can call the fibrosis test. In the last decade, uh, it's really uh, a major innovation in our discipline, in our specialty. And uh, there are tests, blood tests, which can help you to predict the existence and the severity of hepatic fibrosis. Let's say a word about it. You have both simple tests and more specialized fibrosis tests. Simple test. I would like really to emphasize the crucial importance of the simple test, which is called FIB4. And this FIB4 is based on really very simple parameters because it is based on the combination of the age of transaminase, AST, ALT, and platelets. And uh, there is a universal now international consensus on the validity, on the importance of this test in terms of diagnosing fibrosis. And it's admitted that when you have a FIP4, which is less than 1.3, you are pretty sure that you have no severe fibrosis. On the other hand, when this uh, test gives you a result over 2.67, you know, it's very accurate, then you are pretty sure that you have severe fibrosis and even cirrhosis. So this is the simple test. Uh, you have more specialized tests which uh, involve parameters. We, we have something to do with uh, extracellular matrix, for instance, hyaluronic acid, but many other parameters. And just want to quote them. Uh, in France, especially, we are largely using what we call the fibro test based on seven parameters, uh, the fibrometer on eight parameters, but you have also other tests uh, such as uh, the EFs that you have uh, here on the, on the slide. So both simple and specialized tests. Third step for diagnosing fibrosis after the clinical examination, after the fibrosis test, is the imaging techniques. And here, of course, I will allude to another uh, major revolution, diagnostic evolution in our specialty, which has been the elastometry approach, in other words, the uh, fibroscan approach. And uh, <clears throat> you know this device, which is a simple one. <clears throat> Yeah, the principle is to impulse, to give a mechanical impulse and to measure the speed of the shear wave, which is uh, uh, caused by this mechanical impulse. And to be short, uh, when you have less than eight kilopascal, you have no severe fibrosis. When you have more than 15 kilopascal, it's severe fibrosis and even cirrhosis. And the new uh, thing in this area is that now you can combine this fiber scan with uh, another device that we call CAP cap for control attenuation parameter. And this simple device allows you to evaluate steatosis like the ultrasound, but in a more sensitive way than the ultrasound image. So by doing fiber scan plus cap, uh, you make a double hit on the one hand fibrosis evaluation, on the other hand, uh, steatosis uh, evaluation. Of course, you have also possibly combined approaches, uh, mixing biochemical and imaging techniques. And uh, just to illustrate these two things, uh, for instance, you can uh, use simultaneously uh, an imaging technique and the biochemical parameter. And this is called, for instance, what we call the FAST score, F like fibroscan, and AST like uh, the transaminase, aspartate transaminase. So it's a combination of fibroscan and transaminase, the FAST score. But I would like to insist not on the simultaneous combination, but on the sequential 
a value uh, combination, which is in fact uh, a summary of the diagnostic algorithm uh, uh, for uh, diagnosing uh, fatty liver disease. Let's have a quick look to that. Starting from metabolic syndrome components and or hepatic syndrome components, you will suggest a liver disease. You will have to rule out alcoholism and then to know if there is steatosis. For this, we will do an ultrasound examination, sometimes a scap with a viral scan, as we said. And then you are dealing with non-alcoholic fatty liver. Then your concern is to know whether or not there is fibrosis. And the reflex is first to resort to a simple fibrosis test, which is the FIP4. If FIP4 is less than 1.3, there is no fibrosis. If C4 is more than 2.67, there is severe fibrosis. And in between is a gray zone, you are in uncertainty on fibrosis. And if you are in both situations, in one or the other situation, which is either severe fibrosis or uncertainty of fibrosis, then you can ask further uh, exam further investigation, uh, such as uh, specialized uh, biology, fibro, um, fibrometer, uh, fibro test, and uh, also, of course, to fibro scan. This is the overall diagnostic process for uh, diagnosing uh, the fatty liver. So uh, the important point is that all these approaches correspond today to a non-invasive diagnosis of fatty liver. In other words, the need for liver biopsy is decreasing in a major uh, dimension. So that is said today that uh, uh, all these techniques have enabled to reduce uh, the uh, need for liver biopsy by about 80%. So a word now about the hematological view uh, for these diagnostic aspects. <clears throat> I will just refer to a few peculiarities for interpreting metabolic markers and interpreting fibrosis markers. For the metabolic marker, just a word again about ferritin to clarify this point. Uh, when you have in your specialty an increase in ferritin, you have three main possibilities. And it is a result of the combined serum iron in other words, transfer and saturation, we will, which will enable you to uh, differentiate the three situations. First situation, you have an increase in serum iron and transfer and saturation together with increased ferritin. Then there is a high suspicion of iron overload, and it's uh, indicated to perform an iron MRI. Second situation, you have a decreased serum iron and a decreased transferrin saturation. Then it's very likely that the hyperferritinemia is due to inflammation. And it's, of course, important to check uh, CRP each time that you check uh, the ferritin. And the third situation is the one that you, we have alluded to uh, a few minutes ago, when you have normal uh, iron and transferrin saturation together with uh, iron high ferritin, usually it's a sign, it's a dysmetabolic hyperferritinase. The second uh, interpretation, which may be special in your discipline, uh, concerns the fibrosis marker, and especially the FIB4. I told you that it was really very, very valuable, but you must be careful in your specialty in interpreting this, uh, uh, this marker for the following reason. In fact, for the age, for the transaminase, and for the platelets, you may have a differential diagnosis uh, or, or, or limitations. Limitation for the age, because you should know that to date, uh, the FIB4 has not yet been validated in children. The second limitation concerns the transaminases. Of course, uh, before, before being able to uh, interpret correctly the FIB4, you, be, you must be sure that your increase in transaminases is not drug related, <clears throat> is not virus related, such as Epstein-Barr virus or CMV, and also is not the sign or component of the expression of uh, the veno-occlusive disease. And for the platelets, of course, we have also some problems related to your practice, which is uh, uh, platelets, of course, thrombopenia should not be due to bone marrow aplasia. Uh, should not be due when you have a big uh, spleen to hypersplenism 
or even due to uh, a sign expression of the veno occlusive disease. So we can now end up with the fourth part, which is a therapeutic approach. To treat the fatty liver, we have both preventive and curative measures. First preventive measure is to insist on the importance, of course, of an appropriate nutrition and also an appropriate physical exercise, which can have a very favorable impact on the regression of steatosis and even on fibrosis. In terms of curative treatment, you have two main possibilities as always, medical and surgical. What about the medical possibilities today to treat a fatty liver? The main notion is that we have a lot of promising drugs and I have just listed here some of these drugs to show you, to, to show you uh, the, the different possibilities, theoretical possibilities. You have, for instance, obetic cholic acid. And very recently, uh, you have a paper in, uh, in March, uh, uh, in March, uh, in um, gastroenterology on uh, another drug, which is on the same, the same type, which is called tropifexa. Uh, these drugs are agonists of the Farnesoid X receptor. You have also the drug called Aramcol, which, is, which inhibits the steroid coenzyme A desaturase. You have Lanifibreno, which is an agonist of PIPAR. You have Resmetiron, which is an agonist of, of receptors of uh, thyroid hormones. And very recently, there is also a paper uh, on uh, <clears throat> In Gepatol, uh, on the use of SCRNA interferon agents to decrease uh, to decrease uh, uh, fatty liver uh, expression, and <clears throat> end up with a simpler drug and very classical drug, which is semaglutid, which is as you know an agonist of GLP-1, glucagon uh, lipeptide peptide one, and which has been shown to be efficient for uh, the fatty liver with a good tolerance. But the major problem today is that the whole list is off label. And so we cannot use uh, yet this, this drug. I should say that in practice, if you have a drug that you can propose, it's semaglutide, but as an off-label drug, so with the written consent of your patients and taking as a medical doctor the responsibility of your prescription. <clears throat> so this is the medical aspects. What about the surgical possibilities? For the hepatologist, you have two main possibilities. One is a bariatric surgery, and the other one is a liver transplantation. Bariatric surgery, of course, it will be very short. You will not propose bariatric surgery for fatty liver. You will propose bariatric surgery for morbid obesity, but it has been shown that when you treat uh, orbit morbidity, more, um, obesity, morbid obesity by bariatric surgery, there is an efficient uh, impact on the fate of the fatty liver. What about liver transplantation? As I told you, it has become the first indication in the US in women for liver transplantation, fatty liver disease. And uh, a few notions, the first one, uh, it's an increasing indication, even in France, it represents about seven to 8% of the indications of, uh, uh, of liver transplantation. Second, the overall results are similar to the other indication of liver transplantation. And the third notion is that due to the polymetabolic situation, of course, these patients uh, need special care in terms of overall management and the risk, especially of thrombosis, are more important. What about the possible peculiarities of this treatment from the hematological standpoint? Just to say that, of course, we must insist on the preventive measure, nutrition, appropriate physical exercise. And to say that in terms of curative approach, uh, of course, we should insist on the medical possibilities. And for you, the surgical possibilities uh, are more, more or less appropriate uh, uh, in the majority of cases. So this is what I wanted to tell you about this fatty liver as a health problem. And I would like to conclude to uh, propose some uh, general recommendations. The first one is that we have to increase awareness 
of the medical profession, the health authority, and the general public, and this from school age on this syndrome. The second is to insist on the importance of a preventive approach regarding the role of, of a nutrition and sedentary uh, lifestyle. The third is to inform about the non-invasive diagnosis of NEFOL, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, focusing on the interest, not only on the FIB4 blood test, at least in adults, and, but also on the fibro scan. Fourth the recommendation, is to facilitate, at least in France, the reimbursement of non-invasive tests in this indication. And finally, of course, to stimulate research, both for a better mechanistic understanding of the disease and for the development of currently promising drugs. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Brissot, for really uh, beautiful, amazing, and comprehensive talk. You have this fantastic uh, ability uh, to transform something very complicated into very simple, easy to understand, which we really enjoy. So we have a lot of questions uh, and I'll start with one general question we received, which is about, should we uh, screen for fatty liver disease systematically? Yes, it's, a, it's an important question. And this relates to the possible interest of using FIB4 in the general population. So it's a really uh, an appropriate question. And uh, some are proposing that uh, we can really try to check transaminases, platelets, and, uh, and the age in the general population. It's uh, you know, very simple, it's free. And, uh, and to propose uh, this as a possible way of uh, general uh, screening. The, the problem is the following, is that you know, you know that I don't know in several countries, other countries, but in France, you have uh, a number of la private or public laboratories which, by themselves, decide from their uh, from their result without a prescription to propose the result of the FIB4, and this raises some problems because, of course. Uh, uh, the information of the, the announce to the patient may be a problem. If you receive something and uh, the conclusion is you possibly have a cirrhosis and uh, you can expect, you don't expect this type of result, you should be very careful. And so we have a problem of uh, uh, informing GP on, the, on this, and many GPs do not know the interest of this FIB4, and to organize a relationship between the GP and the prescription, uh, the, bio, the biology, uh, the lab, the lab, and uh, and before announcing to the to the patient. So really, I think before maybe a way, but before we have to regulate uh, the the all the circuit between the the patient, the GP, and the lab, so that uh, so that we 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 don't uh, do bad things in in announcements of things that could be also erroneous. But really, this is a, a way to, to try to, 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 to go forward. Okay, thank you very much. I'll take a question about the pathophysiology. And the question is about whether there is a, any genetic background or genetic role in some populations. Uh, I will not uh, answer in terms of uh, genetic role in some population, but we do know that you have some genetic factors before, besides the acquired factors that I showed you that can interfere. For instance, uh, you have uh, variants, mutations in adiponutrin, and uh, which can influence uh, the, the deposits of fatty acid. And uh, you have also uh, some mutations uh, in, uh, in a special, uh, uh, special variant, uh, which is the basis of the uh, SCRNA interference therapeutic that I alluded to. And if you uh, decrease the expression of this variant, you can favor, you can decrease the fatty liver. So you do have some genetic factors which interfere with this and they may well be also uh, a way to, um, 
to have uh, a targeted uh, targets, uh, therapeutic targets, and sCRNA may be uh, one of them. So yes, there is some genetic factors. Okay, thanks. Uh, here we have a question uh, from a colleague who apparently followed carefully because you said on one slide that the uh, role of biopsy in the diagnosis has decreased by 80%. So the question is about the remaining 20%. Uh, yes. Who is doing a biopsy and to whom? I think uh, people who have no uh, access to fibro scan, to fibrosis tests and so on, biochemical and non-invasive tests on the one hand. And the other hand, uh, you know, when uh, you remember the algorithm, when you are at the bottom of the algorithm that you have, uh, you are many arguments favoring the development of cirrhosis, but you are not quite sure. Sometimes you need to be sure that you have cirrhosis of major fibrosis because it will uh, be responsible for a different type of follow-up to check for the development of hepatocarcinoma with uh, every six months uh, an ultrasound examination. So when you have a high suspicion of, of cirrhosis and uh, you need to be certain, also, when you have a suspicion of cirrhosis, but you may have uh, cofactors uh, which could interfere also with the liver disease. Uh, so the histology will help you maybe to find other factors than uh, the fatty liver, which is responsible for the liver disease. And also, when you are in the gray zone, you know the uncertainty zone after having the having performed all these non-invasive tests and you are not sure and you, you want to know if there is or not fibrosis. So uh, this is uh, what is uh, uh, left in terms of indications for liver biopsy. So if you allow me, we'll take a couple of other questions. So when it comes to hematology, we use a lot of high-dose steroids, actually, in different of indications. Of high-dose? Steroids, corticosteroids. Yes. So, for instance, in myeloma, all patients will receive high-dose dexamethasone. Uh, in lymphoma treatment, you have some prednisone, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and in many complications, actually, like graft or cirrhosis disease, we use long-term steroids. So the question is, uh, can you comment on the role of corticosteroids and fatty liver disease? Yes, uh, as I told you at the very beginning, it's one of the uh, drugs which can develop some steatosis. And uh, the relationship between corticosteroid and steatosis is probably uh, multifactorial. Uh, corticosteroids increase neoglucogenesis, okay? And they have also a, a role for decreasing the sensitivity to insulin. So maybe these are factors which can explain. But you know, usually corticosteroid can provoke some kind of steatosis, but it's not major steatosis. But in a patient who accumulates the risk factors, and if you have an increased body weight, as, as often, of course, with corticosteroids, if you have diabetes, as often, of course, in uh, corticosteroids, uh, you can uh, maybe check for ultrasound examination and see if everything is okay or not. Uh, okay, it's more problem of cumulative uh, risk factors. Okay. Another question, uh, apparently from a bone marrow transplanter saying, well, after allogenic stem cell transplantation, we have usually hyperferritinemia due to iron overload. Uh, and, uh, but could this be an aggravating factor of a fatty liver disease? Yes, so when you have proven that uh, your hyperferritinemia is related to iron excess. Uh, and uh, I just want to insist on the importance when you have a dot to perform an iron MRI, which is very simple to do. Every radiologist can do that. And then uh, it's clear that it has been shown both clinically than, uh, and uh, experimentally that uh, iron overload is a cofactor of liver toxicity. Iron overload plus uh, fatty liver can provoke fibrosis. And probably, you know, uh, cirrhosis uh, in the general population uh, comes from multiple factors. And uh, uh, you can have virus, you can have alcohol, you can have non-alcoholic uh, non fatty liver, you can have iron overload. All these factors on the long term can uh, 
uh, be considered as factors of developing fibrosis. I just also do, uh, would like to say one thing is that I have spoken on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but the reality is more complex. And as you know, this profile the, of patients often accumulate uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and some degree of alcoholism. And when we speak, for instance, to uh, liver transplant surgeons, they said, okay, the majority of the patients that are transplanted are not purely uh, metabolic, you know. Okay, so let's take one last question because you alluded to semaglutide as a, a non-approved but usually used the treatment. And uh, we have a question about the side effects and whether this uh, can be contraindicated in some situations of cancers. I, I, I'm totally ignorant in this field, but apparently someone has a clue on this. I think that, uh, as you've, uh, you have heard recently, there is a concern about the large use of semaglutide, not for treating diabetes, but for losing weight. And if you take the social networks, now it's a really a big concern and the health authorities are trying to, uh, to counteract this uh, because of the possibility of side effects due to semaglutide and you can have uh, digestive uh, problem, you can have uh, uh, pancreatitis, you can have uh, hypoglycemia, uh, I am not sure, I have not seen a uh, risk of cancer, but I am sure of pancreatitis, hypoglycemia, and digestive trouble. And, and also on the concern of health authority of the influence of the net, uh, social networks uh, regarding the, the large use of semaglutide just to lose weight and not to, uh, and not to treat diabetes. Yeah, absolutely. You are absolutely right. We are all aware about the skills of Dr. Google and Dr. Twitter and Dr. Facebook uh, and whatever doctor. Uh, but I think you have shared with us your wisdom. This has been really a fantastic webinar, Professor Brice. I personally learned a lot about this emerging really big threat. And I hope uh, that uh, uh, we have contributed to raise awareness about this. And all the ICH webinars will be available on demand. So you can uh, view them within the next 24 hours uh, on the uh, clinicalhematology.org website, but also on uh, the ICH channel on YouTube and so on. So with this, I'd like to thank Professor Brissot for joining us tonight. And I'd like to thank all of you for being loyal to the ICH activities. And uh, the activities never stop because as you may have uh, seen earlier this morning, uh, we have just launched uh, a new activity, the ICH for nurses. So please stay tuned and wherever you are, uh, please uh, stay safe and keep well. Thank you very much. Take care.